Hi, hello, and welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, the woman who spends this episode trying to wrap her head around literally any and everything relating to ancient warfare, because, oh, that is not my area of expertise, but I want to know more. Liv, I'm Liv. And today's episode is one of the most important episodes when it comes to understanding ancient Sparta. Because, I mean, what is the one thing that Sparta is most well known for today? If there could be only one thing, this would be it. Their military. Or rather, their military prowess, I suppose. They're known for being seriously good in war. As Rule will say, super soldiers. If not entirely obsessed with war. Except, like, how much of that is actually true? How much did they base their society around the military and their skills in it? Well, today, we're going to answer that question. And yes, this episode's title is an edited quote from The Princess Bride because it just felt like the right thing to do. So today I spoke with Rule Kneinendijk, who teaches at Oxford and specializes in ancient Greek warfare. Obviously, he was the best person to speak to about the Spartan military and all things that it both was and wasn't. This conversation was so fascinating, not least because it somehow was my first real introduction to the concept of the Spartan mirage. (laughs) A bit embarrassing. It's fine. I so rarely dive this deep into history rather than mythology, so it has been a bit of a learning curve handling this episode. But conversations like this helped immensely and served as the real inspiration to continue doing this series at all. As with the last conversation and the future ones, we did record this back in the summer before I started working on the series in earnest. We talked about Sparta in war, particularly at Thermopylae and what that battle meant for their image long term. We talked about the Persian and Peloponnesian wars at least a little bit, but primarily just about what made Sparta different weird compared to the rest of the ancient Greek world when it comes to specifically their military and warfare broadly. We talked about what ancient Sparta actually did when it comes to fighting and training versus what the modern world thinks that they did and why. Honestly, I never thought I could be so interested by ancient warfare, but this conversation was just absolutely enlightening in so many ways, like mind blowing. You are going to love it. You're going to learn so much and gods, you're going to come out of it with a different understanding of ancient Sparta And definitely the movie 300, because just, wow. Conversations. The classic blunder. Never get involved in a land war with Sparta. Spartan military with Rule Kneinendijk. Spartan mirage is a term that I haven't heard before, but I'm imagining it's just generally the misconceptions around them and the sourcing and everything, or is that something more specific? Yeah, it's kind of the whole complex of the issue that almost all of the sources that we have that talk about Sparta are trying to create this idealized, to construct this idealized image. And so what we learn about Sparta is not just somebody on the ground taking notes, but rather the whole amalgamation of different people trying to make Sparta into what they want it to be. A lot of the time this is based on Spartan propaganda, other times it's based on their own philosophical ideals and whatever else. So you end up having this image which isn't real and which also, you know, rests on certain impossible assumptions like the idea that, you know, this mythical lawgiver like Kyrgyz set down the laws of Sparta and they never changed in the ensuing God knows how long. these kinds of ideas, they're all kind of connected to this to this uh, this term. So Spartan Mirage is the, is the term that scholars have used since, I think, the 1930s to express the idea that the things you hear about Sparta from ancient sources don't actually reflect Sparta unless you happen to be sort of aware of the, the particular backgrounds of these people and the particular experiences that they've had 
can actually give you reason to believe that they are telling you something like the truth. Most of the time, what you're dealing with is not that, but it's actually a constructed version of Sparta, which serves various agendas. Yeah. So all things I'm very aware of and we'll talk about, but I hadn't used the, heard the term before, so I'm glad I know it now. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of really old by now, but you can't go like five minutes talking to a Sparta expert without him saying Spartan Mirage, Spartan Mirage. It's, <laughs> it's going to come up a lot. Um, but it's, as you say, you know, it's pretty obvious what that term is going to mean. Um, but we run into it all the time. We run into different versions. And the interesting thing about the Spartan Mirage that you see, especially when you're talking about warfare, is that the Mirage itself also changes. Just like, you know, societies in history and the way we write history about those societies, the way we misconceive of Sparta is also dependent on our own, you know, what we want to find. And so the Spartan Mirage itself is also subject to change. Mm -hmm. And in particular, in the last few decades, there has been what I what I sort of like to call, but this is just my own personal thing, um, a sort of militarist turn in the Spartan Mirage where in past times, Sparta was mostly admired for being a very stable society with a very good way of indoctrinating citizens in the values that they wanted to perpetuate and they wanted their society to rest upon. So this is more about education systems, values, political, political principles and organizations, um, and the laws and things like that. Nowadays, Sparta is mostly, when you think of Sparta, you think of like, oh, super soldiers, right? This is the idea of the 300 and stuff like that. That's a very recent thing. That's a mm. very recent shift in the way that we lie to ourselves about Sparta. Like none of these things are true, but this in particular is like a very recent story we tell about Sparta based on their own history. So the Spartan Mirage itself is very much reflective of the time that produces it. That's really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't realized that the that militaristic side was so new, like I'm obviously very familiar with 300, I, like <laughs> probably all too familiar with it. Um, and so to me, that's, I mean, that's, a, I've always, that's been my one connection, I think, to that region beyond, it's odd, I'm thinking about it now of studying history in school and my just general classics degree. And like, I don't think we really ended up talking much about Sparta at all, because it tends to be <laughs> Athens focused of everything. And I'm just kind of thinking yeah. about like, what did I learn? <laughs> like, it's interesting. And like in myths, like Sparta is pre-Spartan in the myths, right? So like mm -hmm. Sparta and Homer is nothing special. <laughs> it's just another state. Yeah, like Helen's from there, I guess. So it's it doesn't have that whole baggage attached. And mm -hmm. it only sort of happens later on in Athenian plays that Sparta in myth becomes more like the Sparta they know. Um, which again is like, you know, what, what Sparta is depends on who you ask. Yeah. Um, so that changes a lot. And the, the most interesting thing about that, this is just why I flagged that up, is that the most mm. recent development in the way that we tell stories about Sparta is that we've shifted away from focusing very much on their, um, on their institutions and on their education system, or even, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, there were quite a lot of people who admired Sparta for its eugenic policies. You know, you don't want to ask who those people are. But nowadays, um, there is a very, very heavy emphasis on their military abilities. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was always there, you know, since Thermopylae and other, other events in Spartan history, there was always a sense that Spartans knew what they were doing when it came to warfare. But this idea that they're sort of individually superior fighters who are like the best soldiers of antiquity, that kind of nonsense, that really emerges in the 90s, as far as I know. <laughs> like, it's very, very recent. Wow. Because it is so, that is like the widespread idea. I mean, it's basically kind of what I want to drive this whole conversation to be is like what right. well. yeah <laughs> so we, so this whole this idea of them as this I mean I mean I, I again will always just go back to 300 but I also think that's great because it's a lot of people's access points to hmm. this just to Sparta in general but yeah this idea that they spent you know most of their lives training to be in the military or that like that was sort of what their everything revolved around this or you know sending their kids out to fight wolves in the dark yeah. and like... <laughs> Yeah, so there's, all these there's, really... luckily, there's enough walls for each spot. You know? Yeah, I mean, how convenient. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so that that whole narrative, I mean, the, the introduction to 300, right? The, the prologue where yeah. the narrator grimly discusses that babies are discarded and then we hear about wolves and stuff. Um, I think that's a lot of people, that's their foundation of their understanding of Sparta. And a lot of that stuff is directly based on a ancient source. 
which is Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus. Mm. But that's a very late source, which is subject to many questions as to its reliability, not least by Plutarch himself. I mean, he was already saying, like, I don't actually, I couldn't figure this out because it's shrouded in, in, you know, the depth of the past. and Nobody can tell me when any of this happened. And there are different versions of almost all of it. So he's describing a system that doesn't exist anymore in his day. The most recent remembered version of that system had gone through many phases of change and reinstation, uh, being sort of uh, abandoned and reinstated and reformed, etc. Um, and he's presenting this as if it goes all the way back to you know time immemorial. And so it's this is a very mixed up story, um, and also that prologue of three hundred, which is you know at least based on that one thing, but it doesn't tell you certain very important details, such as the fact that. Yes, Leonidas went through this education system, but firstly, that wasn't normally what kings did. The only reason he went through it as only one of two kings in Spartan history that we know of is because he was the younger son of his father and therefore wasn't supposed to become king. Um, so he lived his childhood as, a, as an ordinary citizen. Um, so kings were nor uh, princes were normally exempt. So they, they didn't go through all this. You know, this is, this is exceptional. And secondly, this idea of them going out into the wild and, and murdering wolves, uh, that's a separate part of the Spartan upbringing, which is shrouded in uncertainty. And we don't actually know any of the content of that system. Its earliest attestation is in Plato, so more than a century after Leonidas. And in Plato, it's just an exercise regime. Like they just have to go out and live off the land. Basically, they don't do any murdering and they don't do any any wolf killing or anything. Um, then later on, it gets changed into this deliberate terror regime, which is something that occurs only in much later sources. And we don't really know when that started. In any case, we don't really understand the details of that system. So the point is, this prologue is telling you all sorts of things that have a basis in the sources, but it's completely jumbled. It doesn't tell you what is and is not exceptional or normal, and it's happily slamming together things from, you know, six, seven centuries of of Spartan history, and it's all just like all of that happened all the time throughout. <laughs> like, no, we don't, we don't, we don't actually think that. <laughs> um, uh, as far as our sources even indicate, there was significant change in all of the things that you're being shown, um, and some of them, some of them didn't happen. You know, some of them weren't actually common. Um, I'm sure others are going to come on your show and tell you about how all the baby murder didn't happen either, because that definitely didn't happen either. But that's that's a separate issue. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> no, that's but that will be absolutely part of it. I I'm not totally sure who will talk about that yet. But if no one does, I will because that that is a big part of what kind of prompted this idea too. Is is seeing there was like articles coming out a few months ago about how that wasn't a thing broadly mm. and certainly wasn't a thing in Sparta. And yeah, um, that's Debbie yeah. Sneed, right? Because that's yeah. great. that's great stuff. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I actually like she was sort of prompted a lot of this idea and then put but suggested I talk to Owen about all of this. <laughs> so, mm. yeah, Perfect. it's a yeah, it, that's a fascinating aspect as well. Just the I mean, the God, the eugenic side. And all of, it's it's so interesting how it's many different varied levels of like horrific parts of humanity have like latched onto these things in Sparta that seem quite different too. like you're looking at the eugenics and then also yeah. later looking at the militaristic and like, I mean, you know, I think about the Molon Labe way too much just because of, well, I mean, my, I'm Canadian and we had our great convoy nonsense uh, oh, yeah. over the past while. And there were people with those flags out and you're just like, or there's always a great, you know, there's always a viral tweet using that <laughs> phrase or the the most recent one that was just fun was oh it translates to you know there's free guns in this car like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like but even just you know all of it is it's so fascinating this idea that that has become this phrase for yeah. for gun rights advocates and and all of this when i mean i think that the number one thing and the funniest thing is yes uh persia did take them like they, uh, yeah they came and took it yeah yeah that's, that's and it, exactly what happened you it know, didn't and... go well <laughs> why are we using this as like a thing that's you know supposed to be some sort of like idea of strength uh but yeah, I yeah. mean that that anecdote is another good example. I mean, this is something that Owen will tell you more about. But mm -hmm. this this idea that um, you know in the movie 
the Persians shout at the Spartans saying, you know, hand over your weapons. And Leonidas responds, you know, shouting across this plain as, as he brandishes his spear, come and get them. And then you read the actual sources. Okay, firstly, Herodotus, the most contemporary source, but already <laughs> generations yeah. after, doesn't mention this, right? Doesn't occur mm -hmm. at all. It's not a thing. The first person to mention it, that anything like this happens is Diodorus, which is four centuries later. Oh, right? I didn't know it was in Diodorus. That's so late. So Diodorus says that there is an exchange about this, about the oh. about the weapon. He doesn't actually spell it out. I think it's Plutarch who's actually the first source to use this phrase of saying, okay, well, the Xerxes wrote a letter, right? Yeah. This is <laughs> important. He wrote a letter saying, surrender your weapons or else we'll come and get them. And the, the, the Spartan replies, we come get them. But it's just like, this is the most sort of, you have to imagine Leonidas sitting there, like, well, I'll show him. And then drafting, <laughs> you know, drafting a nice little letter and sending it off with a messenger saying, and scowl while you deliver this. <laughs> you know, make sure he gets the message. <laughs> I mean, this is not like this is not the scene that we see in the movie. This is so embellished, and you have to imagine that when these people, when these 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 uh, Second Amendment enthusiasts are taking this on as a, as a slogan for them, they're building it on the movie. They're not building it on you know the history. They're not building it on the source material. They're so many steps away from that. They're just like writing three hundred fan fiction for themselves. This isn't about like this, <laughs> and three hundred itself is like fan fiction of Herodotus, which is fan fiction of the actual history almost. You know, it's like we're very, very many steps away from this here. Um, and so, yeah, like this is the kind of thing that I, I'm trying to say with all this is that when we're talking about Sparta, when we're receiving Sparta through something like 300, we're many steps removed from what we know. What we know is very shaky and patchy. Like there are many parts missing, many parts uncertain. And it's presenting all this, firstly, as things we're certain about, because there you go, it's on film, right? This sounds like something that someone must know uh, for a fact. And secondly, that are just continuously true throughout Spartan history, right? So it's telling you that throughout this period, they were already all of the things that they're ever said to be. And of course, that's specifically not what the sources imply when you get all this information from Plutarch and not from Herodotus. <laughs> so you don't get it from contemporary sources. You do get it from sources writing under Emperor Trajan in you know, <laughs> 600 years later. Well, it matters that that gap exists. You know, he's not just saying, okay, well, that's the way it was. He's building on centuries and centuries of embellishment. So, you know, you have to imagine that all of these things that you hear, they may come from any period of Spartan history. They may never have been, never have applied to the period that you're actually talking about. Um, and the movie is kind of presenting this to you as a done deal. Like this is just, that's the way it was. You know, we can read it in Plutarch. You can check it if you want, but it's like, no, it's not that simple. <laughs> in fact, almost everything you say, it can just put question marks by it because it's like, it's just not, it's just not so certain that it was there, or we, or we definitely know that it wasn't. You know, we definitely know that that wasn't a thing yet at that time. Um, and that's that's the really crucial thing when you're watching something like that, or when you're reading about Sparta. You have to bear in mind this is a, a society that changes over time, a society in particular that works very hard to live up to its own hype. And I think that's a very important thing to bear in mind. It's a society that becomes known for a certain thing, right? the self-sacrifice of the 300 at Thermopylae. Once they become known for that, they dive into that. They really lean in to the idea that they are unrelenting, never surrender super soldiers who, you know, will fight anyone and will never give up for what they, you know, for the cause they're fighting for. And it's only from that moment that they start to develop into that society. And it takes them centuries to get to the point where Plutarch can sit down and say, right, this is, these are the ancient customs of the Spartan. Um, that wasn't all there at the beginning. The whole point is that it wasn't there at the beginning. They start to become like that because people think about them as, you know, the heroes of Thermopylae. Um, so we're putting the cart before the horse when we're pretending that all of these institutions, all of these practices, all of these values already existed, and that made them into the people who did that at Thermopylae, you know, who sacrificed themselves in that battle. Um, no, it's the other way around, <laughs> you know, because of that one sacrifice, which was based on, you know, a recently reformed set of customs and ideas that Leonidas clearly didn't quite 
know how to apply in practice. Um, because of that set of set of events, Sparta gets sort of set on a path towards this militarization, this path towards this single-minded focus on um, their military reputation and on a society that is built on these values, these, these values of selflessness and self-sacrifice, etc. And it takes them, you know, as I said, it takes them centuries to really reach the point where they, um, you know, they have a system where youth have to go out into the countryside and murder wolves. You know, this, this it doesn't happen overnight. This isn't something they just come up with because it's cool or because it's like something that this mythical lawgiver like Hergis came up with one day and they all thought it was perfect. Um, it's something that they do to try and reinforce um, what other people think they are and what they would like other people to believe they are because it helps them, of course. You know, it's very good when others believe that you are, you know, indestructible warriors who will never surrender. That That is a very good thing to have on your side. <laughs> um, so this kind of thing is, is uh, it develops over time, it changes over time and, and, and very intentionally so. Um, so we have to kind of try and tear those things or separate those things out and not believe that Sparta was always Sparta and will always be sort of this monolith of, uh, of martial ideals. That is absolutely fascinating. I hadn't realized that it had kind of, kind of gone about in that way. And of course it makes perfect sense looking at it and, and just thinking about it like that. And the, the question of sources and the time periods is one thing that comes up on my show a lot. And I always try to emphasize it to my listeners because it's it's an e like equal but different problem in in mythology because you know now we come at mythology and we want like a canon we want the stories to match up we want the people to all you know have the same parents or do the same things and I just every day I'm like it, you can't it's not how it works we we don't we can't think of modern narrative structure and put it onto mythology. They weren't developed as narratives. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's interesting to see it on that, that historical side as well of looking at that gap in time. Mm. Um, one of the things I go to all the time. So I'll say it again here for the listeners is like thinking about the time periods in between a source when, or when something would have happened if it had happened. And when somebody wrote it down, like in the, in the case of Plutarch, this is an even longer um, gap of time than I usually go with, which is, you know, I'm usually looking at like Homer to the playwrights and why mm. something's different. And, and I just, you know, use the modern reference, modern reference of like Shakespeare to now and looking at the number of things, the, the way the world is different in that many hundreds of years right. and thinking like, that's what it would happen back then too. Like, this is not like a, <laughs> a structure where, where things would have been even like remotely the same, but we just think of ancient Greece, you know, and if you're not in that world, you think of ancient Greece as like this thing, this one yeah. sort of time. Mm. And and it, it's so important to be able to separate those things. So Plutarch being the main source for all of this is fascinating. Like you said, <laughs> in time of Trajan, I didn't realize he was quite that late in Rome, but like always consider him just like he's a Roman source. So I'm going to keep that kind of tucked away. <laughs> um, the only thing I ever really read Plutarch for or have is for the life of Theseus, mm. which I have I also find to be fascinating. And I think it's probably very similar to like Hergus, because they're both mythical mythical founders of the you know the two most important city states in in ancient Greece, and so that's sort of fascinating in itself of looking at that because to me Theseus is like the most ridiculous mythological character, and 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 so I always come at Plutarch in that way. Yeah, uh, but yeah, just the the idea that they then built themselves around sort of an a concept that they had inadvertently created through the 300 and Thermopylae is, is sort of fascinating in itself. Does that, does that kind of tie into one of the things I always try to remind people if anyone's talking about Thermopylae is like there were 300 Spartans. There were a lot of other Greeks. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I know this, that absolutely ties into it. So the idea is that, so the, the sources that we have from Sparta before Thermopylae, I mean, they're very thin. We don't have much. But you don't get any of the impression that Sparta is a particularly militarized society. In fact, a lot of the institutions that later become associated with them, like the unit stratification of the army and the kind of institutions that they have in terms of um, initiation into the citizen body, none of that stuff is there, right? So when you read the early poets that are actually from Sparta, Alcman, Tertius, 
um, they don't include any of that stuff. They don't look at Sparta, although Tertius writes about warfare, he doesn't talk about Sparta as being a militarized state or particularly effective in war. It's just another city. You know, it's just another city with people who have to fight to survive. This is like any other Greek state, essentially. Um, and so before Thermopylae, you really don't have anyone at any point saying Sparta is particularly good at any of this, right? It just isn't, um, it isn't known for war. It isn't known for anything really, except, you know, beautiful women, I think, which is entirely due to Helen being associated with the city. So it, it, Laconia has beautiful women. Um, and then, and, and uh, hunting dogs as well. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so this, this is the kind of thing that, um, that you see before that time. So you know that this idea of Sparta as being very militarized, um, it isn't there since time immemorial. It's not like, oh, from ancient times, from before anyone knows, Sparta has always been very good at warfare. Um, in fact, there is a, a tradition in the later Greek authors that Sparta initially was very poorly governed, and then Lycurgus came and changed all the laws, and that actually made them a well-organized state. So there was already in, in Sparta's own mythology, right, in their own stories they told about themselves, there was a time when it was just, you know, a really badly run ordinary city state, and then suddenly they changed. Well, the question then is, when does that happen? Where does that come from? Um, and some of that stuff clearly comes from the decades before the Persian Wars. It's very hard to date any of it. But when you look at when it first appears in the source material, mostly stories from Herodotus and things like that, um, it's somewhere in the end of the sixth century. And it coincides with the time when Sparta starts or stops expanding its own territory, uh, which it did during the archaic period, just by being very big, it managed to overcome its neighbors and enslave the population. It stops doing that and it starts to incorporate others in a network of unequal alliances. So its mm -hmm. neighbors are no longer subjected and, and sort of assimilated into a helot population, but rather they are made into allies, allies, I'm doing air quotes. The air quotes are not going to be on the podcast. I'm going to do air quotes here. Um, this is a very, this is a very bad way of, of presenting. Um, so <laughs> they become, they're made allies, but they're not allies in the sense of like, okay, we're equals here. They're allies who are made to swear. Um, the literal wording is something like they have to have the same friends and enemies as the Spartans, and they must follow wherever the Spartans lead. Mm -hmm. What that means is basically their foreign policy has to be exactly the one, the same one as Sparta, which is to say they're not allies, they're subject allies. Mm -hmm. They are essentially um the fodder for sparta's foreign policy essentially they, they have to if sparta says this is where we're going they have to follow so by doing that their power sort of snowballs and they become uh rulers of the entire peloponnese so this is the whole sort of southern peninsula of the greek world right mm -hmm. this is more or less uh established by the end of the sixth century so around the same time that we see evidence for major social and political reforms in sparta they also have managed to establish themselves as the most powerful state in the Greek world. And the primary reason they seem to, they, that seem to be behind that growth in power is simply that they're one of the biggest. They just have a big population. And by the time of the Persian Wars, Herodotus tells us they had 8,000 adult male citizens. That's huge. Like mm -hmm. the, almost no one else in the Greek world has that number. Athens has that number. Maybe Syracuse, but not in this period quite yet maybe Cyrene in Libya, but most Greek cities are much, much smaller than that. So they have, they just have a lot of bodies and that's not including the perioikoi, which you can add to that. So the freeborn uh, non-citizen population of Sparta, which you can easily use to double that number. So there are just, there's just a lot of Spartans <laughs> and that allows them to throw their weight around. So by the time the Persian Wars happen, Sparta is undisputably the most powerful state at that point though they do not have a military reputation it's just not there right there is no sense in which sparta is considered particularly good in war in fact many of their peloponnesian neighbors have successfully resisted them at times so they actually beat them in battle the tegeans for instance mm. so you have people who are um who are able to just take on the spartans and win that's not an issue like nobody thinks that's weird um because sparta is just another state sometimes you win sometimes you lose. um but they do a lot of winning and so that's what happens in the end is they sort of take over and at that point, they are, um, as I said, the most powerful state in Greece. And so when the Persians start to become a credible threat, people look to them for leadership. They say, well, you will have to protect us now. Like if we band together, it will be pointless if you're not on the team. So it will be you or no one, right? Like if you don't help us, then we, 
and this is a serious proposal. We just, you know, flee to Sicily or Sardinia, just move <laughs> up sticks and move Greece somewhere else. Um, so the idea is like, this is, um, this is Sparta's time to show, right, that it's a worthy leader and that it is worthy of its status as the most powerful Greek state, that it knows its responsibility is to look after the little ones, to combine these, for, these resources that they required uh, to do something for the, for the common good. So that's what happens in the Persian Wars. Um, so you have uh, the, the so initially, obviously, in the various conflicts, the, the, the Spartans don't do anything. It's notoriously, they don't do anything. Um, when the Ionian Revolt happens, so Greek cities in Asia Minor rebel against Persia, the Spartans do nothing. Um, everybody's kind of looking at them like, wait, why? Like, they have whole stories about how they thought it was a fool's errand, etc. They don't do mm-hmm. anything. The Persians then continue their expansion across the Aegean. They invade Athens. You know, they have the Battle of Marathon. The Spartans pledge their help, but show up late. Uh, they say there was a festival going on, which is a big theme. Um, but like they show up late and they're like, wow, that's a great thing you did. Uh, we were definitely coming to help, right? Um, <laughs> that's That was absolutely going to happen. Um, so you, the Spartans are basically not doing this. And they, they're arguably, they're not pledged to. It's fine. But people are looking at them like, you know, maybe you should do a little bit more to look after the rest of us. And so when the Persians finally invade in force, so this is Xerxes' invasion in 480, um, the Spartans actually do take command of the alliance. And that is the point where we start to get into the, you know, the big battles of Artemisium and, and Thermopylae. This, that's the first time when the, the, the Greeks actually band together and, and um, confront the invader, essentially. So they've found that this pass, which leads from central Greece into, sort of from northern into central Greece, um, is the best way to stop this massive Persian army. So they send an army over there to block them. Earlier, they had tried to block and pass further north, north of Thessaly, but they realized that there was a way around the pass. So they withdrew the army and reconsidered, which is kind of like a foreshadowing of what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. This is kind of something that Herodotus has put into the story. But the idea is that they are, they are looking to, so the Spartans and the other allies are looking to defend uh, central Greece, at least. Um, so that's why they decide to send an army there. Um, and so this is indeed not just the Spartans deciding, well, we probably ought to go and do something. Let's go fight the Persians. Anybody else who wants can come and help. This is the, uh, the alliance of the willing, essentially, those who are combined in this, in this resistance to Persia, saying this is what we have to do. This is the bottleneck at which we can still stop them. So we have to do this now. Um, Sparta has the leadership on land and sea. They, they, they don't allow anyone else to, to take the leadership from them. And so Sparta says, okay, well, we'll go. We'll go to, go to Thermopylae. At that point, obviously, the other states that are in this Peloponnesian League, this alliance system of the Spartans, they have to go, right? They have no choice. Because, as I said, in the alliance system, they, they have sworn that if Sparta says Persia is the enemy, they have to also think of Persia as the enemy. So they have to muster their forces. So they have to come along. Um, so already in those earliest accounts, well, they, there is word of 4,000 men from the Peloponnese alone. So the, this Peloponnesian alliance sends 4,000 men. And then, of course, the local populations around the pass, who are heavily interested in making sure the Persians don't <laughs> advance any further, they come out in force. Now, they're smaller communities. This is Phocians and Locrians, so they're, they're relatively uh, minor communities. But they still bring thousands of additional troops. So we're talking about a combined army that is at least 6,000 and possibly many more. So that's the, the whole um, allied army. And the Spartans within that army, I mean, by all sources except Herodotus, as far as I know, there are a couple of other stray references to the 300 alone. Other sources say there are actually a thousand Spartans. Oh, wow. So this, this number of 300 is most likely explained by the fact that only 300 of them were full citizens. So mm-hmm. those are the Spartiates, right? So these are the, the full Spartan citizens with citizen rights. And the other 700 will be perioikoi, um, to whom we should add an uncounted number of helots, which we know were there, but they're never mentioned. You know? mm-hmm. Nobody counts the enslaved people. Um, so you have 1,000 Spartans plus 3,000 other Peloponnesians that are marching out. And that's the, that's the army that goes to the past. 
But in the later narrative, because this becomes all about the Spartan sacrifice, because it becomes all about this heroic story of Leonidas and his 300, the others get shoved and elbowed into the margins. And they have to reassert themselves. So you have these states who are setting up individual monuments after the fact, saying, we were here too, we fought to the death too, like we were there, we stood to the last with Leonidas. They're trying to sort of latch on to this, uh, this glorious narrative. But by that point, the narrative's out of their hands. The Spartans have kind of hijacked the story of Thermopylae and have made sort of themselves into the centerpiece of it, and specifically their citizens and their king, not the others who came along with them. Um, and more and more as you go, others are being pushed to the sidelines to the point where a source like Catesias, so this is like even in the fourth century already, um, early fourth century, he can say that there were only 300 Spartans at the pass and no one else, right? This is wow. something that becomes the story at that point. Um, thankfully, we have the other accounts that are much more open about the fact that there was a whole alliance of states present. Um, but the Spartans are clearly doing this on purpose, you know, and others are helping them do it because it's a much better story that way. Um, so they are making it into a story that is just about them. But in the beginning, it wasn't. This was this was the alliance effort on land. You know, on sea, there was a huge battle going on with many uh, ships from all over the Greek world. And on land, there was the army at Thermopylae. And this was their big first attempt to stop the Persians. That. That's so, yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I, I had definitely had an idea of how many other people were involved in Thermopylae, but even just looking at it from the side of how it became what it is seen as now is so interesting. And then am I right to in like the number of Persians that went up against them also changes a lot, right? Like, <laughs> is that also by Sparta or is that more broadly like time? <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, so the, the, the number, the earliest number we get is from Herodotus, who says that there were, oh, wait, actually, that's not the earliest number. There are some poetic references to, like, you know, millions. Um, Herodotus says the, the the army of the Persians contained more than two million fighting men. Um, so it, these numbers are incredible. Like, we, we can't no. believe them, right? No. Um, they're logistically impossible. And there's a lot of scholarship on this, which says, like, you just can't. This is just not possible. Um, there's also, a like, famous quote from, them? sorry? Also, how would you count them? Like, well, so th this is the interesting thing about Rhodes. I, I want to get into that um, because this is an okay. this is an interesting aspect of Rhodes. When he comes up with this number, he's not just saying like uh, pff, two million. That's a that's a sufficiently <laughs> large number, right? That sounds impressive. No, like this is Herodotus at his most scientific. When he comes hmm. down on this number, he is telling you exactly how he came to it. He's saying, okay, well, these people were involved in the expedition. This is how many they each sent. This is how many ships there were. So we multiply that by the number of crew of the ships. And then you can see how many there were in the naval contingent. And he just goes through it like this is a long chapter in which he goes wow. through all of the numbers that he has. And not only that, but he says the Persians themselves made an effort to count all of them by building a little enclosure that could keep 10,000 men and then pushing in 10,000, saying that's one, you know, ticking, ticking it on the wall, whatever, ticking a box moving them all out, moving the next 10,000 in, taking it again and going on like that until the entire army was counted. So he says there was like, you know, empirical evidence for this claim, which is obviously nonsense. Like this clearly didn't happen, right? But he really wants you to believe that it did. He's doing yeah. his absolute best to make you believe that this was based on the most reliable information they could possibly offer. So it's a really interesting aspect of it that the number that we are most likely to reject, and you know, we clearly should. Mm -hmm. um, that is the number that Herodotus went to the greatest lengths to prove. Like he really wanted to be to be scientific about this. That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, I mean, I love this because it showed you that the, we shouldn't think of this too much as like, oh, you know, they, because a lot of ancient sources exaggerate the numbers of uh, non-Greek or non-Roman armies. Like the Carthaginians, always hundreds of thousands. The Persians mm -hmm. are always hundreds of thousands. We know it isn't real. We know it's exaggerated, but it's too easy to say like, oh, they just didn't, they just wanted to wanted you to believe that these numbers were incredibly large. And so they threw out a random number. Like they wanted you to think that those numbers were real. And so not only does Herodotus do this with, with all the calculations, et cetera, I think what he's trying to do is give these numbers a you know, truthiness, it's a wonderful word. Like, give them a plausibility to the audience that they really would walk away with. Because if he said, 
Well, and Xerxes brought an army of, you know, modern estimates say maybe 60,000, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, that people would say, well, if it was only that many, like, shouldn't it have been much easier? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not a, that's not so heroic, you know, that's not so, and also that's not, that doesn't sound to them like the whole Persian empire coming down on them. You know, that sounds like, okay, well, you know, if you put a couple of states together, we can bring out 60,000. Like, that's not, that's not a big deal. <laughs> Um, so there is a degree to which he I, he both had to do it and felt that it was reasonable to do it, and that he you know he he felt that he had the the grounds on which to do that. Like he had the he had the numbers, you know, he had the 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 data, or as far as he he could understand that, you know. That's just so, so specific too. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like well, I can't yeah, no, fully get to, over the to, like the ten thousand thing. <laughs> No, it's down to the single man. Like it's 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 absurd. And woman, in yeah. fact, because he eventually comes up to a number of like two and a half million, and then he says, "Okay, well, I don't know how many others they brought in terms of like servants and and cooks and supply merchants, and obviously, you know, women that families that come along with these armies when they travel, concubines, entertainers, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So he had loads and loads of other people that would always accompany ancient armies. He says, "I don't know how many there were, so I'm just going to double this number." <laughs> Um, and so he comes up to, I think, 5.2 million in the end. Wow. Um, and he's, you know, he adds, and I'm not counting the baggage animals and the dogs. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, he could go on, you know, he wants to. But the idea is like, on the one hand, that number is clearly fictional. But on the other hand, he's really trying to be as meticulous as he can. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, it's not arbitrary. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so there's a very famous quote from a modern scholar, like modern, I say modern, this is like 1900, who argued <laughs> that if you actually had 5 million people together, then by the time the first people were arriving in Thermopylae, the last would just be leaving Susa. <laughs> so you have a column right. along the road, you know, stretching all the way from modern Iran to Greece, uh, because it's just too many people. You just can't, you move them down a single road is impossible. Yeah, 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 I mean... It's too many now, let alone in the ancient world. Right. Move 5 million people. No, it's like, you know, you see the kind of crises that result. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's clearly not a real number, but the problem is that that actually makes it, that makes the problem worse because mm -hmm. Herodotus really wants it to be. It really tries to prove that it is. Mm -hmm. um, but this is this is a tangent, obviously. <laughs> but fascinating. But Herodotus feels like, I mean, he did like to exaggerate. Um, but he, I'm just curious, like, I guess he was just, his intentions were just to, to make the Greeks overall f seem more, you know, impressive. Because he didn't really have a big stake in Sparta's game, right? Mm. Unless, Yeah, well, I mean, so Herodotus as a historian is quite honest in the sense that he tells you what he's doing. And that's something mm. that a lot of later historians don't. So Thucydides mm. doesn't really tell you like where his information is coming from or what kind of editorial decisions he makes, um, except in a very few occasions where at one point Thucydides is also like, OK, when I if I were to tell you the real number, uh, you wouldn't believe me. So I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but like, Herodotus is very open about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So often he will tell you like, okay, well, this is what these people say, but this is what these people say is contradicts it. And I don't know which one to believe. So I'll leave it to you. These kind of mm -hmm. things. Right. So he's very open about saying like, sometimes he believes it. Sometimes he doesn't. He does do source criticism, but he believes that his duty, obviously there was no historical profession. He was literally creating this more or less out of whole cloth, what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And so he decided that his job was, to write down the great things and things worthy of memory um, of, you know, great achievements and things worthy of memory of Greeks and barbarians. So, you know, not just mm. the people that he represented, but also others, just the kind of things that are worth knowing about in the world. Um, and especially in recent history, which is what he was writing about. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's not just saying like, okay, well, we want to make the Greeks look, look great, or we want to make Sparta look great or anything like that. But he was using predominantly Greek sources for this, of course. And he was going around asking them, okay, so what did, what, <laughs> what do you think happened? You know? Um, and of course the problem you then run into when you don't have a historical profession, you don't have archives yet in the Greek world is that every people you ask will have their own story. And that story changes based on the needs of that people. 
-hmm. So if you go to the Athenians, they will say, well, we saved the Greeks because all of the important battles were on the sea and we have the most ships. <laughs> um, conveniently, we are now the leaders of a naval empire, which is obviously also very important for the protection of the Greek world, you know? These kind of things are self-serving narrative. And they will say like, oh, well, the other naval peoples, like the Corinthians, well, they didn't do anything at the Battle of Salamis. <laughs> and then Herodotus goes to the Corinthians and they say, well, what? No, we were absolutely there. You know, <laughs> what do you mean we fled? We didn't flee. We were part of it. You know, we can show you the, you know, the monuments that we set up. So all of these states have their own story. And it's not just that they're all telling different sides of the story. It's that that story changes over time because they later become, you know, friends and enemies. All these alliances shift. And so they want to tell that story differently. And this is very much true for the Spartans as well. So they were telling him a story. He, we knew he, we know he had good sources in Sparta for lots of the stories that they told, but the story they told was obviously a very particular one, which was glorifying the role of Sparta. Mm -hmm. um, and so you do get that a lot, but it's very interesting when you talk about Thermopylae in particular, that Herodotus is already um, essentially critically evaluating the Spartan story. Mm. And this is a very difficult thing to pick apart, but it's brilliant, been brilliantly done recently by Hans von Weiss, who has an article specifically on um, the two versions of the story of Thermopylae that existed in antiquity, because there are two and they both survive, which is very strange. Mm. Um, one is the older one, but it survives only in later sources. And one is the later one, but it survives only in Herodotus. Mm. And it's very difficult to sort of piece this apart, um, but, what it boils down to is that Herodotus, when he asked around, he received a story of the Battle of Thermopylae, which is very much pro-Spartan, very heavily, you know, the Spartan narrative of why they did what they did and how it was the most heroic thing ever. And he was already skeptical. He was basically like, mm. you know, he had talked to Persians, he had talked to Thebans who were also involved on both sides in the conflict. He had talked to other people who were there. And or not there at Thermopylae necessarily, but you know who were involved, peoples who were involved in the battle who had sent their own detachments, and so he was not so sure about all the things the Spartans were saying, and so the way he told the story is already kind of trying to process the different versions that he heard and trying to blend them into something that he felt was a more believable narrative, and so at many points in that story he will tell you two different things, and one is clearly the story that he believed and the other is clearly the story the Spartans want you to believe. Mm. Um, so the version that you get in something like 300, which is predominantly based on Herodotus, is already actually processing various steps of source criticism, so to speak, um, mm. from Herodotus. Although it's also mixing in then parts from Diodorus and Plutarch and these other later authors who are using the older version that is more pro-Spartan. Um, so it becomes very complex when you look into the details. But the point is, um, that the story as Herodotus tells it is not just Spartan propaganda. It's actually already um, a kind of critical review of that propaganda. So it's, it becomes, uh, you know, a very sort of muddled tale in which the heroism is real. No one denies the Spartans that they, you know, fought to the death and that it was a glorious thing to do. Um, but the reasons why and the order of events and the specifics of that, of that sacrifice and, and all sorts of things are, are different. And there are different ways that we can explain these things. And based on that, critical account, we can also now bring out more differently, even more different versions of that, of that narrative, even more different explanations for what happened. Um, so it's really thanks to Herodotus that we have that opportunity, because if it weren't for him, then we would just be stuck with a Spartan propaganda tale, essentially, mm -hmm. um, which would not help us very much, unfortunately, <laughs> because it's a mess. Yeah. And so, so from there, from there, you know, from Thermopylae and them sort of beginning to take that on as their history like how do they kind of set about turning themselves into the people that you know modern understanding now suggests that they were before Thermopylae <laughs> yeah so yeah like picking up what I said earlier so you have mm. the Spartans in uh, around the time of the Persian Wars they're nothing special then Thermopylae happens and then after that I mean, we don't really hear anything from Sparta for a while because our sources for the period just after the Persian Wars are terrible. Mm. But you then have the Peloponnesian War in which the Spartans, when they're seen again in battle for the first time after the Battle of Plataea, so the decisive land battle of the Persian Wars, mm -hmm. you don't hear anything of Spartan tactics for like 60 years. And then the Spartans are back in the game in the Peloponnesian War and the Battle of Mantinea in 418. And suddenly 
the way their army functions in that battle, firstly, is nothing like the way it functions in Herodotus. Hmm. But secondly, it's something that Thucydides has to, four times has to go out of his way, step out of his narrative to explain what they're doing, because clearly he thought that this was highly exceptional and that his readers wouldn't understand. Huh. And so it seems that in the intervening 60 years, the Spartans developed numerous ways of behaving in battle that were totally divergent from the way that other Greeks were doing things. Um, and that other Greeks needed to have explained to them because they just didn't get it, except that it kept bringing the Spartans victories in battle. So they're doing things differently, which suggests to me, and this is obviously something that you know other scholars have also argued, but it's not directly stated as such by the sources, but that the Spartans have decided, okay, well, I guess, I guess we're, I guess warfare is what makes us better than others. It helps us keep these subject allies in line. It helps us to keep a reputation as worthy leaders of the Greek world. It helps us to, you know, project our power abroad if others are already sort of trembling in their boots before we even show up. And so what we're going to do is we're going to live up to that. We're going to try and be better at war than other states. And that is when they start developing all sorts of things, all sorts of features to their way of war that are notably different from the way that other Greeks keep on doing things. Um, and that's when they start to essentially develop this idea of the Spartans as we know them, which is like, um, you know, highly disciplined, highly effective, highly capable uh, warriors that, that emerge in that period. Now, I shouldn't overstate that. I also always want to stress like, okay, they're not super soldiers, right? Their education system, it's really important to stress this, has no military elements whatsoever, right? There is no part of their education in which they're taught to fight, use weapons, use formations, none of that. That doesn't occur in any source that describes Spartan education. So their education is not military, it's civic. Mm -hmm. um, their training... We don't know when it starts. We only know indirectly that it even happens, their military training, from the way they behave in battle, from the way that their military methods are described. So we can tell that they're doing stuff that other Greeks can't do, but we don't know when they learn that. Mm. <laughs> Most likely they learn it from the time they come of age. So when they turn 18, they become eligible for military service. But just like in other Greek states, the uh, citizens between the age of 18 and 20, normally they're not sent out on campaign. You don't want to keep those young ones, you know, in running, walking around in everybody's way. So you leave them at home with the elderly while the men between the age of 20 and 40 do the work when they, when they go abroad. Um, so it's probably in that period and possibly not even then, but only when the army is called up, that they actually do some military training together with the others who are serving in their army. So together with the Perioiko, who are also called up at that moment, that's when they maybe start to actually do some training. But they do, and that sets them apart from others. So their training is limited. Their improvement upon the general Greek model is limited, but it's enough to give them an edge over other Greeks in battle. Interesting. So and it, that you first you answered the follow-up questions I was going to ask. So that's great. Of <laughs> just like how much they actually, you know, devoted themselves to it, uh, of it not being part of their education is is so important. Um but I'm curious too, like, is it just what makes them or what sort of turned them into this idea of, I mean, super soldiers or just like the, you know, the the military people? Is it kind of I this is lessening at all but like it comes down to they were just the ones who seemed to do some training ahead of time and who had these like i'm also really not uh i've <laughs> never talked about military anything so i'm like man even just trying to phrase questions no that's all right I, 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 I do. <laughs> i'm here to fill this gap um no it's a, it's a, it's it's an interesting combination of things, actually. So it's, it's on the one hand, it's the idea, um, I kind of want to separate the idea of super soldiers and the idea of Spartan military effectiveness, because no mm. one in antiquity ever says that an individual Spartan is a better fighter than anyone else. Mm. Right? Individual warriors are as good as the other, you know, mm. in fighting, in, in actual combat, what matters is, are you able to dodge the spear that's coming at you? Like, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a skill thing, it's a luck thing for the most part. The ancient mm -hmm. Greeks don't really believe in weapon proficiency like we do. Hmm. So like in modern armies, you spend some time learning how to shoot. Um, in ancient armies, until the Romans, basically, you don't spend any time learning how to wield a sword or a spear. It's not a thing. It doesn't hmm. really matter. 
there are some training programs that start to develop in the Hellenistic period, but in classical Greece, certainly you don't learn that stuff. And it's considered to be sort of ridiculous. Like, why would you learn that? Because what matters is not whether you're able to use a spear well. Um, the point is that you're willing to do it when the enemy is right in your face. Hmm. And it's much more about that willingness. It's much more about that morale, you know, about that, that backbone, essentially, the, the fearlessness and the commitment to the cause. That's what makes you a good warrior. And then the rest of it in Greek accounts is basically endurance. Um, so the willingness to endure hardship. So when you're on campaign, you might have to go without food. You might have to march at night. You might have to sleep in a tent. It might be very hot. It might be very cold. You might not have water, whatever. You have to be able to take all that without complaining. That's what makes you a good soldier. So fighting, fighting skill is not very important. What's important is your willingness, right? your, your, your preparedness to make sacrifices um, for your military aims um, and to work together with others to achieve them. And so what makes the Spartans effective in war is essentially, and what make, gives them the reputation for being very military skilled, is firstly that they spend more time clearly thinking about how to do this well, mm -hmm. um, which is about their army organization, their officer structure, their camp organization, their campaign procedures and, and their institutions, etc. They have a bit more sophistication in these things than other Greeks, which makes the Greek things makes the Greek think, wow the Spartans really have this figured out. I wish we could do the same kind of thing, um, but our army doesn't want to take those steps. You know, they don't want to make the effort. So mm. it becomes very difficult to kind of spread those ideas, which frustrates ancient authors like Xenophon and Plato. They're like, guys, the Spartans know how to do this better than us. We should probably pick that up or they'll keep, you know, whooping our asses. <laughs> but instead, um, you know, these, these are not professional armies. They're just militias. And they're like, well, that sounds like a lot of work. So I'm just not going to do that. So that's one thing. So the Spartans take more effort to do this. The other thing, of course, and this is what sets apart Spartan society um, along with other uh, oligarchies in the Greek world, is that their citizen body consists entirely of the leisure class, right? In order to be a Spartan citizen, you have to meet a certain property threshold in order to pay your mess dues. Um, but you have to do that without having a profession because the law doesn't allow Spartans to have a profession. Really? In other words, yeah, so they, they can't they can't make money in a in a way of that that you know most of us do. Like you, you mm. can't work for a living because the state has claim to your time. That oh. means that the only ones who could afford to be Spartan citizens were those who were in the leisure class. In other words, those who had others to do the work and make the money for them. Mm -hmm. uh, which is to say those with estates that were worked by Helens. Mm -hmm. um, now that means that every single Spartan citizen is a leisure class, you know, an estate owner is a leisure class citizen. And that all of his time is available for the benefit of the community, for the benefit of the state. And that means that he is much more flexible in terms of his overseas deployment, in terms of his availability for military service at a moment's notice, in terms of his availability for public training and everything like that, and in terms of his ability, availability for political decision making and service in magistracies and overseas garrisoning and all that sort of thing. So fundamentally, the Spartans just have a pool of manpower that they can just deploy anywhere at any time which most other states don't have because they're not a leisure class oligarchy. Mm -hmm. um, so when other states like Democratic Athens musters an army, only the leisure class, which is a small section of that population, can actually serve abroad for any length of time or be available in the way the Spartans are. Um, because most of the population, they eventually just have to go home. You know, they have to harvest their crops. They have to go back to work. You know, they have to make a living. Um, the state in Athens eventually makes up for this by paying them for military service, which is a great relief on that on that system, um, which then spreads throughout the Greek world. But for the Spartans, this is just something they were always able to do because they are a leisure class militia, right? So the entire citizen body is simply available for whatever the state needs them for. 
at all times. And the kind of things that they spend that time on, apart from warfare, which is not, you know, not all the time, they're really not at war that much. And Stephen Hodkinson has a really interesting uh, article recently in which he basically lays out the data on how often Spartans are at war. And it's really not that right. often, but, you know, 10% of the time, maybe. Wow. Um, but uh, so compared to other states like Athens, that's, that's peanuts. Um, mm -hmm. They like to mostly let the fighting do by, be done by others. Um, but what they do is, for instance, daily athletic exercise. So they stay fit. And the purpose of that, of course, is to remain useful for the militia, to be good bodies mm -hmm. in those armies, to be obedient, to be, um, you know, to have endurance, stamina, to be able to work in the hot sun, that kind of thing. Um, so they have all sorts of things that, because of their leisure, they have the luxury to prepare. You know, because of their leisure, they have the luxury to think about people. Um, and that sets them apart from other Greeks. And as long as there are many Spartan citizens, that actually is just a very effective core to the Spartan army because those guys are essentially unmatched in the amount of time they're able to spend on preparing for this kind of thing. And that's not all they do. They have a lot of leisure time. You know, they're not spending all their time drilling or anything like that. They don't do practically any of that. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of exercise, but they also spend a lot of time on their estate, et cetera. But they're available, and that's the main thing. Right? So they can and do think about this, prepare for this, etc. Um, and that's something that, you know, other states can't match because they just don't have that big of a leisure class. They just don't mm -hmm. have the institutions that require that leisure class to be available all the time and to be around in the city for exercises, for uh, military service, or whatever. So they, they have a much less um, uh, restricted sort of set of, of rules for the for the leisure class, but at the, uh, on the con on the flip side, they also have a much wider franchise, both of which limit their ability to do war like the Spartans do, essentially. Yeah, so so many things that kind of set Sparta apart from from the other states around them sort of add to all of it. Because then I think, I mean, and this comes into what you were just saying, but their their hella population and like the fact that they had all this like enormous enslaved population to do literally everything for them in a way that like, obviously the rest of Greece had enslaved people, but they did not have the level of that population of Sparta. That's so interesting. The way that everything just kind of contributes to them being able to create this. Yeah. I mean, you have to imagine like no Greek state has, uh, has an army, right? There are no standing armies in the Greek world until, you know, you have small standing units towards the fourth century, but Initially, that, that just doesn't exist. So every state relies on its population. Uh, when they go to war, that's just, you know, that's you. That's you and me, essentially, you know, except that, you know, only men are allowed. But it's like the kind of thing that, you know, ordinary people are expected to do for their community. Mm -hmm. um, there are no professionals. And that's, that's still true at Sparta. It's often mistakenly argued that Sparta has the only professional army in the Greek world, but they don't. Mm -hmm. they, they are a militia just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's just that they are a militia that is constantly available. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between that and a professional army, of course, being that they're not being paid to do that. They're not a profession because that's not allowed. Being a soldier yeah. is a profession. They're not allowed to have a profession and work for money. Um, but they do, um, you know, they serve their state in council and war, just like the ideal of a Homeric hero, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that sets them apart from other Greeks. That perfectly lined up to remind me of something I meant to mention earlier, but it it seems to me too, like if they're building this idea of themselves after Thermopylae, you know, turning themselves into a more, you know, powerful military, um, that that would sort of like mythologically link up quite well to the history from Homeric, you know, epic and everything of Sparta is just another bit of Greece there. But of course, they have this inherent bit of Menelaus winning and bringing Helen back and all these different things where like as much as they were just another city state like they are the one who features in most heavily um, especially comparatively to Athens which is like basically not in the Iliad at all uh, and so that's so fascinating because it's kind of like they get this sort of later ability to link themselves up to that mythology by building their military after the fact and then being mm -hmm. like oh but also you know we're the Sparta of of winning the Trojan war and, and, you know, like defeating everybody and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Menelaus comes with them when they go to war, uh, they carry a statue that the cult statue of Menelaus comes with them when the army marches out. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. So they, I mean, they have a big, you know, they have a big cult of Menelaus. Of course they have a temple mm -hmm. of Menelaus. 
um, and they they bring it with them uh, as well as the Dioscuro actually. So they they mm -hmm. bring these statues with them because obviously that's you know that's the the warriors they want to be on their side. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I mean there's a lot of these kind of cults that that are folded into their military practices. Um, so for instance, being a herald in uh, in Sparta's I think is a hereditary position, but they are still sort of mm -hmm. they have a cult of Deltibius as well. So this this mm -hmm. the herald of uh, the Spartan herald in the in the Iliad. Mm -hmm. uh, so these kind of things are, um, are you know, they're all sort of um, constantly appealed to. You know, there, there's always this where people saying like, oh, this goes back to, you know, the time of Homer. Uh, mm -hmm. Time goes, goes back to the heroic age. Oh, that's really interesting. I Obviously, I, I'll, mythology, if I can pull it back in some way, I'm going to. It's also interesting and also trying to wrap my head all around the, the historical aspects of it, which I love and I'm glad I get to do this more. But um it's just I don't know, Sparta. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, it ties into this really funny thing that I think is worth you know stressing when you're talking about the Spartans as being very effective warriors is mm. one of the things that in that specific context Xenophon really praises and thinks sets Sparta apart militarily from other Greeks is that their use of religion on the warpath is much more systematic. Mm. So they are much more they they have you know flocks that they carry with them that are sort of officially uh, earmarked for sacrifices on the march and they have these regular sacrifices in the morning where the general and all the officers are present they call they come into the tent and share the omens they know exactly you know what's go, what's what's been foretold and things like that. So the idea that the Spartans are much more regimented about the way they do sacrifice on the march for Xenophon, that's one of the ways in which they stand out as being more professional soldiers, which is a very interesting way of thinking about warfare that for us moderns can be really alienating. But that's really important to bear in mind when you're thinking about Sparta and Spartans as, as fighters is what that means in antiquity can often be something that you totally don't expect. Um, but for them, it is, is obviously immensely important. Like you need mm -hmm. to make sure that you have the gods on your side, which is like the platitude. Of course, you want to make sure you have the gods support in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But also you have to realize that things like sacrifices are a form of intelligence gathering. Mm -hmm. They have a very professionalized system of intelligence gathering, which is to sacrifice a goat every morning and whenever they cross a river or a border or something like that. And when they read an omen, and they are not sure that it's positive, Spartans will turn back, you know, they will turn this bus around and go home. You know, that absolutely happens many times in Spartan history that a, Sp a military campaign is just aborted because they just decide like, no, omens aren't good. Like this isn't gonna mm -hmm. go well for us. <laughs> so they take this very, very seriously. This is absolutely a form of, you know, taking control of your surroundings, taking control of the, of the knowledge that you need in order to win uh, wars is is entirely religious and that just brings me right back to the iliad because one of the things that i can never get over having read that enough times is the sheer volume of hecatombs of animals that they sacrifice oh yeah <laughs> and i just think my god that just would have been far too many animals you know I, uh, the, my favorite story and that's is like they when they pledged to athena i think it was athena or artemis uh, the Athenians pledged pledged to uh, to Artemis, I think, that they will kill as many sacrifice as many goats to her as they kill Persians at Marathon, and then they kill so many Persians they have to say, right, um, shall we do a hundred a year, and then we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> they're obviously showing off, but it's also like it's pragmatic. Like I like the way that they're just not like, no, we're just going to wipe out the entire goat population of Attica <laughs> every year. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's so interesting, too. And, and I had a guest on once and talked about that. And they brought up too, like, as much as it's, you know, also for show and for the gods and everything, but it's also just like a way to keep your army fed. And when you have that many people, that many animals kind of checks out, even if it sounds like far too many. And I just kept wondering how they would find that many continually on the plains of Troy for 10 years. I just think that's impractical, but indeed. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> there are many questions about that. I mean, given that the poem doesn't really seem to understand siege warfare and doesn't seem to have a sense that they are besieging a city, it's entirely <laughs> in the open how they actually it's you kind of have to take every day of the Iliad as the first day of the conflict. That's the only <laughs> yeah. way to make sense of it, really. Meanwhile, it's supposed to be nine years in. That seems like yeah. so much more should have happened in that time. Right? Like you're only now building that wall. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> 
how are you still intense on the beach? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like those ships are waterlogged to the point of uselessness. You're not getting home on those ships. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, leave it to me to pull it back to mythology. But that's really interesting too, that connection to religion. And and so did they did they deal a lot in like the Oracle and all of that? Like, did that come into their military aspects or was it more so their own like sort of hands-on omen yeah no they they absolutely i mean obviously the oracle of the delphi has a long and, and story connection to the spartan kings i mean uh, they are always sending emissaries out to try and see what the what the oracle advises mm. um you know they, they they always want to make sure that that apollo is, is in favor of what they're doing famously apollo came down on their side at the beginning of the peloponnesian war so he said i will support mm. you um which is was later, of course, interpreted as the cause of the plague of Athens. We guess. Mm. Um, so that all fits together very neatly, as they mm. always do. These omens. So this, <laughs> <laughs> these oracles are are, are always going to be, you know, suddenly relevant. Um, but yeah, no, they're they're very they're very involved in that. And in fact, they try to use patronage of the Delphic oracle as a way to extend soft power into central Greece. So this is something that becomes very important for them, especially in the fourth century. Is that they are one of the members of the Amphictyonic League, arguably, uh, which is the league that is sworn to protect the sanct sanctity of, of the Delphic Oracle. Uh, most of that is, is in central, most of those states are in central Greece, but Sparta is also one of them mm. um, on behalf of the Dorians. So all of the Dorian states are represented by Sparta in this, um, in this council. And so they essentially patronize them and say, like, we are your protectors. We will, you know, make sure that you, we look after you. And on a few occasions, um, they actually do intervene on behalf of the shrine. So they, they try to make sure that that shrine stays on whichever side they happen to favor at the time. But, you know, they, mm -hmm. they do um, send forces out to try and mostly to prevent either the Athenians or the Boeotians having too much influence over it. So um, it becomes a political, um, uh, you know, bone of contention mm -hmm. uh, for them as well. So they're, they're very heavily involved in Delphic Oracle. Oh, that's so interesting. I always ever think about it in mythology. I remember to look at the the history of this. Like, I'm sure they made up some myths to justify this. I don't. I can't think oh, of any yeah. on the top of my head, but I'm sure they're there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think like Sparta just doesn't feature into much of it in the mythology, other than than Homeric as well. So I'm always mm. sort of like trying to even think of what ones I know off the top of my head. But they're other than the Dioscuri and and Helen and everybody, they just kind of left out a little. Um, but I will certainly find more for the show. <laughs> they certainly made up for it in, uh, <laughs> in yeah, like everything else. Yeah. <laughs> well, throughout this, all I, I keep thinking is uh, my the, like sort of most references I have to Sparta now are just obsessively playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Yes. Which is arguably kinder to Sparta than than a lot of other things. But mm. <laughs> Yeah, it has some really weird. <laughs> Sorry, now like I'm intrigued. No, it's like a, it has some really weird features, but it's mm. it's it's definitely like I mean, I always like to say like to remind myself whenever I start to bicker about any particular detail, it's just like this is you know this is the most comprehensive virtual realization of the ancient world that's ever been created. Like it's incredible. It's so good. Like you know, sure there are lots of things we can quibble with, but like <laughs> please do more of this. You know, it's it's yeah. fantastic that someone can commercially do this by building a game around it, which I'm sure like they wanted the game first and the setting second, but like we can flip that around, doesn't matter. An audience mm -hmm. is an audience, you know? So it's fantastic and I really love it. Yeah, I just, I could talk about way too much, so I won't, um, but <laughs> <laughs> but I do love like just even the experience of Sparta there is so, I don't know, it feels like they're not as much over the top in emphasizing the the military aspect. Cause they're, I mean, obviously, cause they're trying to make the two more equal in order to you know win the game and everything but it's yeah. sort of interesting to see it from from that respect um and then i realized that my grasp of history is far too based in that game at this point but well <laughs> i mean I, I haven't played the game myself so i only know of mm. it through various sort of walkthroughs that i've seen and and um scenes or cutscenes that i've seen but there's like a scene where the spartan kings fight a duel to decide on policy and that <laughs> yeah. is just like perhaps not accurate <laughs> Oh my god! Like there are so many layers of why that's wrong. <laughs> it's pretty funny, and then also they, they like because uh, they use all or for the most part historical figures, but mm. then they also introduce this whole backstory of like a completely invented cult. Um, right. But then they put that cult, like for good and bad, onto historical figures. Um, so I'm going to forget the names of the kings, uh, like, but they're the same kings at the time of of. Um, 
Pericles. So, hmm. or at least one of them. But it's just interesting to like you make one of them bad and you turn this like historical figure <laughs> into like some secret cult leader. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want to keep you for too much longer, but I want to make sure, is there any other sort of particular aspects of, of Sparta that you want to get out in this way or, or things you think need to be addressed in terms of the way people understand Sparta? I don't know if, I don't know if you wanted me to go into any of the actual details of Spartan military practice in terms of why they are different, but like, I'm I'm imagining this might get boring very quickly. So you might sort of leave leave out the military stuff when it gets into too much detail. But I guess I'm happy I mean, to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just you know they they're slightly more organized, as I mentioned. They're slightly mm-hmm. more disciplined in terms of their abilities on the battlefield. That lets them the lets their commanders have more control over what happens in a battle. Whereas many of the others, being sort of untrained militia called up for the moment, don't have that level of control. Don't have that level of tenacity. And the result of that, I mean, I think this is important to stress just briefly, mm-hmm. is that when you're talking about the Spartan military reputation. Yes, to some extent, it is defictionalized, so to speak. It's like it started as a story and then it became real. Um, mm-hmm. And it didn't become that real. It's not like, you know, the Spartan army could ever hold a candle to any professional army, any legitimate professional army of antiquity. You know, if you're looking at the armies of Alexander or Hannibal or the Romans, I mean, these are much more complex organizations that are capable of much more effective and comprehensive warfare. Um, but within their own sort of small pond, the Spartans get to play a big fish in because of their minor incremental improvements on the Greek system. And so that does actually mean that they remain undefeated in pitched battle for a period of about 150 years. Wow. So in that sense, you know, you could say like, okay, well, they've achieved that, you know, their, their prowess in battle was sufficient for that. Um, there are two caveats to that. The firstly being that Pitch battle is only one kind of warfare, and there are many other kinds. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so this is just basically, basically what you see in movies, where two armies sort of line up across the field from each other and actually sort of go at each other in, in gotcha. full sort of uh, you know formations and numbers. Um, that's sort of the pitched battle, which is where the Spartans excel because they have greater organization and control. So mm. the more the more people you have together on a single field, the more that matters. Um, but when you're talking about things like sieges or skirmishes or, you know, running battles where armies are marching from place to place, they suddenly get attacked, you know, surprises, ambushes, things like that. Um, naval battles, the Spartans do much worse. I mean, they often mm-hmm. lose. They just narrowly specialize in this one thing, which they did in Thermopylae, which is mm-hmm. face the enemy, don't back down, make sure you overcome them in sort of close combat, in this sort of face-to-face kind of engagement. And so... In one way, the Spartans are really effective, but in other ways, it doesn't put them so far above the rest that, you know, they conquer the Greek world or anything like that. I mean, they don't physically do that. They do that in the end by using Persian money to fund the fleet, which is not really the way that you imagine this to go. It's, you know, Mm -hmm. don't really want to go into that story. But the point is, like, um, they are very much sort of a, you know, one eyed in land of the blind kind of thing where they have limited advantages in certain situations, but that is enough to give them a significant edge um, where it matters. But as soon as an actual professional army turns up in the Greek world, which is the Macedonian army, the Spartans are immediately and totally outclassed. They have no chance of ever fighting this army. Mm -hmm. Um, They try it once um, in the Battle of Megalopolis in 331, and they are absolutely wiped out. So (laughs) there's just absolutely no chance of a Spartan an army organized on Spartan principle, even reinforced with Persian money and masses of professional Greek mercenaries, they just can't compete with the level of training and efficiency that comes from having a professionally organized and trained army. And so when those armies start to appear in the Greek world, which starts mainly with Macedonians, um, the Spartan system, which is based on these leisure class militia, it's just done for, it can't keep up with that. It just isn't built to be able to oppose these large professional royal armies that do nothing but win wars for their, you know, for their hegemons. Um, so that's when, when before that already, Sparta was having trouble maintaining its hold even in its own territory against states that were more and more capable of copying their methods. But at that point, Sparta's just done, and there's there is no way that they can come back. Essentially, <laughs> their power is just is just no longer significant at the point where the Hellenistic kingdoms start to come into play fascinating the things i've never thought about in that way so is it just that kind of like i'm just thinking of why 
the armies, why there was a professional army in, in Macedonia. So it was that just like sort of just an, a thing they ended up establishing because they had the resources or what have you, or did they like recognize it would be a better way? I don't know if this is going to be like too intricate of an answer or anything, but I'm just that. Yeah, this so could easily be a two hour lecture. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> I mean, to keep it brief, it was something that the Greeks were already playing along with or play, mm -hmm. playing around with, with the idea of standing units, because then like the Spartans, you could spend more time preparing them for war and they would be more confident of their abilities, which makes them more effective in various operations. Um, but most Greek states just didn't have the money to do that on the scale um, that even the Spartans did, you know, this, this mm -hmm. big leisure class that I mentioned earlier. So they couldn't do it with more than a few hundred men at a time. Um, so the only ones that were sort of trying to show the way ahead were the great tyrants of the fourth century. So you have Dionysius of Syracuse and you have uh, Jason of Ferrae in Thessaly. And you have a couple of other of these uh, sort of major figures that kind of take control of a larger area, not just one city, but like mm -hmm. a huge, like all of the island of Sicily, for instance, or all of Thessaly and, and some surrounding areas. And that gives them the resources to maintain massive mercenary armies. So they're just hiring people. You know, these are any people. You can bring them together from all over the shop. They will serve for money. When you don't need them anymore, you send them home. That's fine. But they're showing um, the Greek world, essentially, the, the, the merits of having an army that is nothing but soldiers. These are people who do soldiering for a living. Mm -hmm. And you keep them in your employ for a long time. You train them. You equip them. You make sure they have support, you know, supply tra trains, siege trains, uh, naval operations, all sorts of things. And then suddenly they become capable of things that a militia army can't do. Mm -hmm. um, but they're using mercenaries to do this because they don't rely on their citizen bodies because they're tyrants. So they, they don't trust citizens, especially not citizens with weapons. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't like to rely militarily on militias. But the Macedonians, what they, how they change warfare is they essentially pick up that idea of having a large army of professional soldiers but they use their levy to make that army. So they use their ordinary population. They call them up. They say, hey, you want a job? <laughs> I've got a job for you. Here's a giant pike. We are going to march around across this field all year long. And then when, <laughs> when war comes, firstly, you're ready to go because that's your job. You have nothing else on hand. And secondly, you have spent years preparing for this. So you're going to be much better than you know that guy over there who was just called up two days ago and doesn't know where he is. Like this is the big change is basically just to make that standing army out of your own population and create a class of professional soldiers that is very carefully prepared to win wars. Um, and that's that's the way it sort of escalates. And from then on, you can't go back because once one state has an army like that, nothing else will do, essentially. Mm -hmm. So Sparta tries it once. At the end of the third century, mm -hmm. they try to reform their state um, massively introduce new people into the citizen body. They create a new uh, citizen population. Uh, they re redistribute land. They allow a bunch of foreigners and mercenaries into the citizen body, et cetera, et cetera. They try to completely revise their constitution mm -hmm. to become a player once more, you know, because they've fallen into obscurity and they weren't happy about it. Yeah. So they make one final push to completely revise everything they are in order to become a player on the Hellenistic stage. And it lasts about... 20 years and then the Macedonians come down, crush them again, and it's over. That's that's it for Sparta, basically. It's just like you can't you can't compete with this. You don't have enough resources in your city-state territory to compete against Hellenistic kingdoms. You just can't. So while you can maybe muster a large army for one campaign or for a few years in a row, while you can maybe train that army in the way that we do, you know, you can maybe keep them around and teach them some usable skills. Um, if you lose that army in a single battle, that's it. You're on the ropes. That's all the resources you've got. Whereas these okay. kingdoms, you know, oh no, I lost an army, bring another one. <laughs> so this kind of resource pool is just incomparable. And, and Sparta, like other city-states, they just cannot be a serious player in that world. And so they cannot, mm. they cannot compete with that. Um, and so that system that they have, even after massive reforms, is just obsolete. And that's mm -hmm. the end for, for Spartan power and, and, and military um, performance in this world. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, it's so fascinating. And Sparta is just such an interesting, it's just so much more interesting given the way we see it now. And that's obviously why I started doing these, this series of episodes, but it, it's extra. I'm just, man, so much history. I never get to touch on history. This is great. <laughs> I think about all the other yeah. ways I can talk about history. Uh, <laughs> 
but yeah, I mean, this has been absolutely wonderful. I know it's probably getting late there for you too. So, um, is there anything else you wanted to share or I don't, I don't know, <laughs> happy to hear long enough. I mean, I, can, I, know. I can keep going as you can tell, like, this is my problem. <laughs> no, and I'm always happy to hear it too. So I like to weigh the, like, oh, I don't want to take up too much of people's time. And also I'm always happy to hear. So, but this has been wonderful. So I'm, I'm certainly thrilled with the episode as we have. Yeah, it. Thanks so much for, for letting me round all. Maybe it just definitely, uh, I mean, feel free to cut any of this that you feel is sort of way, like, going too far <laughs> off topic. No, it's been wonderful. And honestly, letting, people rant is my favorite thing. It always comes out fascinating. And like the, the scholars are the perfect people to do it. You just get them talking and it's always perfect. It's my favorite. So no, I'm very happy. I'm really glad to hear it. Thank you so much. This is really fun. Thank you. Um, is there anything you want uh, to share with my listeners anywhere to follow you or read more or hear more? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter. Basically, that's the main way to uh, to keep in touch with what I'm doing. I'm uh, I'm starting a new job in Oxford in September. So I'll be teaching over there and um, I am constantly producing stuff, but it's like academic for the most part. So if you'd like to ask me anything, or if you actually want to know more about what I do, the easiest way to reach out to me is actually either through Twitter or um, on Reddit, Ask Historians, which is the subreddit that I moderate and where I'm one of the experts on Greek warfare that you know answers questions from anybody who uh, wants to post them. That's awesome. I didn't realize it was on Reddit. That's great. Well, it's not great, but you know, <laughs> we okay, might do. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> accessible. That's it. It's accessible. That way. Yeah. So Ask Historians <laughs> is a subreddit. So you, you can just like join, you can just, uh, you know, you, you don't even need a, an email address, I think, to make an account. You make an account, you post your question. And if I see it and I have the time, then I will give you an answer based on what I know. And I'm happy to answer any questions about Sparta or Greek history in general. And we have loads of other experts to answer your questions about any other part of history. So please, please come and uh, come join us there. That's wonderful. Well, I will link to both of those things in the episode's description so that everyone can find it. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. It's been really lovely. Absolutely. It's been great fun. Oh, nerds. Thank you so much for listening. What an absolutely fascinating conversation. Just fucking love having these. I love how many amazing people want to come on my show and share their knowledge. And it's just, it's the best. I'm so thrilled that I've been moving into history too. Like even if I often feel deeply and completely out of my element and wonder uh, just how much of my classics degree actually stuck in my head. I need a major refresher on Greek history. Pew. Still, this was so good and huge thanks to Rule for sharing all of this, for teaching us all so many things about what Sparta was and wasn't. As we talked about at the end there, you can find Rule on Twitter, I've linked it in the episode's description, but also on the subreddit Ask Historians, which I've also linked. And for good measure, I've added a number of articles that he's done on Bad Ancient, which is an amazing site that I will continue to mention on this series. Because it's really helpful, and also one of the people who runs it, Owen Reese, is next week's conversation guest. There's just so much there. So many questions and assumptions, both confirmed and debunked. Like, it's like the Snopes, but for the ancient world. Let's Talk About Myths, Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She handles so many podcast-related things, but for this series, Michaela was absolutely invaluable, providing so much research, script writing, articles, everything I could possibly ever need. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. You are all the absolute best. I am Liv, and I love this shit. Mm -hmm.